Well, this morning I, I uh, wanted to pass along a story you may have heard about a guy who fell off a cliff and on his way down, he was able to grab onto a tree branch that was jutting out from the face of the rock. And as he hung there, reviewing his options, he started yelling, is anyone up there? He was surprised to hear a voice say to him, yes, this is God. And the man was greatly relieved and he quickly stuttered, God, can you save me? Hello, I'm God. Yes, I can save you. Well, the man was really happy now and so he shouted out, great, what should I do? The answer from the Almighty was not what he was expecting. Let go of the branch. After a very long pause of silence, the man replied faintly, Is there anyone else up there? We're like that man sometimes. As we're struggling in life and we ask God for help, we know that God will provide, but we're, we're not really sure he'll come through for us. And so we hold on and wonder if there's maybe someone else up there. We want God to help us. We don't always know what he's going to do or what he's going to say. And specifically, we're not always interested in letting go of those things that we think are holding us up. We're in the midst of a series of studies on the various names of God called the, called the I Am series. Our English Bibles don't really present his name in great detail. That the names, uh, the same names in the original languages do. In most of our translations, we only read the names what? God and Lord. But we've been reminded in this series that God goes by the name of Creator God, Elohim. That he goes by the, na the name Lord God, or Adonai. And that he has a very personal name, a relationship name, called Jehovah, or Yahweh. As we learn to call him what he himself goes by in Scripture, our knowledge and awareness of the Almighty grows, and our faith in him deepens. We now turn our attention to compound names, combinations of names, if you will, that together present even more specific, specific details of who God is. So we'll be looking at combinations of Jehovah or El, short of Elohim, or Adonai, and seeing how they work with other names. This morning our focus is on one of those compound names. He is Jehovah Jireh, which means God, our provider. It's found in only one verse of the Bible, Genesis 22:14, but it's also arguably one of the most famous of the compound names in all of Scripture. We know from the Bible that God loves to meet the needs of his people. He counts every hair on our heads, and he sees the sparrows that fall to the ground. It says so in Matthew. And because of that, he will take care of us. Examples abound in Scripture. God, remember, pray, uh, provided for Daniel when he was in the den of lions. He came through for David when a, with a rock that wiped out a great giant. He provided manna for the Israelites in the wilderness, and he delivered Gideon from the mighty Midianites. God loves to come through for his people, but his people don't often love to let go. Perhaps the most moving and heart-wrenching and misunderstood account of God's provision in the whole of, Bi of the Bible is found in Genesis chapter 22. It's a famous passage, but let me give you some background here as we go forward through it. Abram, Abraham was called by God when he was 75 years old from an area what is now called Iraq, Mesopotamia, but, but we now call it Iraq. In Genesis 12, he's told to leave what he had always known and live in a land that God would later show to him. To let go of all that was familiar to him demonstrated incredible faith on Abraham's part. God then promised him that the entire world would be blessed through his offspring. But when time passed and Sarah, his wife, was still not pregnant, Abraham took things into his own hands and he fathered a child by his wife's servant. He compromised then, but he was also courageous when he went on a rescue mission to get his nephew Lot back from the bad guys. Abraham demonstrated a lot of positive qualities, like appealing with God not to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. But we also know he twice lied about his wife in order to protect her. And finally, after 25 years of waiting, the son of promise was born to them. When he and Sarah got the news, they both started laughing, and so God gave the boy the name Isaac, which means laughter. Abraham's name was changed to, uh, from Abram to Abraham, which means father of a multitude of nations. Now the promises of God could finally be fulfilled through Isaac. I imagine the entire household was filled not only with laughter, but with joy as well. But God still had some things that he wanted to teach Abraham. By chapter 22, we're introduced to four new words that were never in Scripture prior to this chapter. 
Four important words used for the very first time in the Bible. The first one's introduced right here in verse 1 of chapter 22. If you have your Bibles with you and you want to go to Genesis 22 or it'll be on screen or if you're joining us online uh, is on screen as well. First one says, Sometime later God tested Abraham. He said to Abraham, And here am I, he replied. The word we see here is test. We've never seen test in Scripture before chapter 22 of Genesis. Now pay no attention to those who would teach that it's never God's will for his children to go through suffering. Or that all suffering is an indication that God is somehow displeased with us. There are some who would use this name, Jehovah Jireh, as proof that God wants, wants only to give you the good things in the life. The best of cars, the best of wages, the best of, of houses. But that's not what scripture indicates. Abraham was the friend of God. But in God's wise and good providence, Abraham was called upon to endure the most heart-rending trial any man has ever had to face in this world other than the man of sorrows, Jesus Christ. But Pastor George, I, I didn't think God tested us or tempted us. Well, it's true that God will never do anything to tempt us to sin. And in James chapter 1, it says, when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they're dragged away by their own evil desires and enticed. But he does allow circumstances into our lives that will reveal what is in our heart. Deuteronomy 8.2 says, Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and to test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commandments. Now, the word test literally means to test completely through a demonstration of, of stress. In a similar way, if you look at the, the label on a lamp or some electrical equipment, it'll say underwriter's laboratory, which usually means that they've tested thousands of products, not to break them, but to demonstrate that they're actually very good and reliable. Abraham may have been on cruise control spiritually, but that was all about to change because God wanted to know what was really going on in his heart. God calls out to him, Abraham, and like a true servant, he spontaneously replies, here I am. Abraham's ready to hear from God again. He's probably eager to know what God's newest message is. Perhaps God was going to announce yet another blessing in his life, or have him move to another exotic location, or get him ready for some big battle. This is the seventh time we know that God has spoken to him, but this time, God is going to demand something out of Abraham that will be extremely costly and very confusing. Verse 2 says, Then God said, Take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain that I will show you. Here's the second of those four words he introduces. The word love is not introduced in all of Scripture till this chapter. In case Abraham might be confused about what God's asking, notice how very specific God is. Your son, your only son, the one you love. Isaac. No doubt at all of what God exactly expected of Abraham. He's putting his finger on the fact that Isaac was everything to Abraham. And that was the bulk of the problem because God alone should be everything to him. God alone should be everything to us as well. God was saying, look, we've walked together for many years now and you have the son you've longed for. Tell me, Abraham, is the son more important to you than your relationship with me? Keep in mind that God doesn't tempt us like Satan does. The devil tempts us to prove how very bad we really are. But God tests us in order to prove the very best that's in us as well. Someone has said that temptations often seem logical, while tests seem very unreasonable. And this test certainly does, doesn't it? To receive the son that he's been promised, to receive the son he's been waiting for all those many years, only be told to sacrifice him? What an unreasonable request it sounds like from God. Real faith is not believing in spite of the evidence, but obeying in spite of the consequences. Those three words, you can see them there on screen, take, go, and sacrifice, must have taken his very breath away. There was no doubt what he was being asked to do. Once again, Abraham is commanded to go somewhere he's never been before. What will be his response? See, total commitment will also always be costly. David said this, I will not sacrifice to the Lord my God burnt offerings that cost me nothing. 
A burnt offering is a total sacrifice, with the offering being completely consumed by fire and signified the complete dedication of the one making the sacrifice. There was no way the offering would be walking back off that altar. So what was Abraham's response? Well, it goes on, 3 to 5 says this, Early in the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son, Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. And on the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we'll come back. When Abraham received this tough test of faith, he didn't argue with God. He didn't didn't bargain with God. And notice not one word of objection is recorded in the entire text. He didn't say, yeah, but. He obeyed. Instead, he practiced immediate obedience, in fact. Have you noticed in life that delay, when it comes to God's commands, almost always turns into disobedience? When we delay responding to God, obeying to God, it almost always ends up in disobedience. Jesus, I'm sorry, James had said and, and put it in a harsher perspective in James 4.17 said, anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, does what? Sins. Now it's not doing bad, it's knowing to do good and not doing it. That is also sin. It's disobeying God. I used to cringe whenever I came across this story. It bothered me. Why would a loving God demand this of a loving father? And why would a loving father so willingly comply? But I need you to notice something here. Notice the pronouns. It says, we will worship, we will come back. Abraham believed that he and his son Isaac were coming back down off that mountain. He did not know how. He saw God work in very miraculous ways. But now he knows that somehow we'll come down. And now we're introduced to the third of the four new words, worship. Worship had not been introduced in all scripture yet. And it vividly shows how weak our definition of worship can be. How often do we see worship as nothing more than singing a few stanzas of Kumbaya, my Lord, when in reality worship is so much more. There are many things that can accompany worship, but there are two things that are required. Worship, first of all, is total submission to God. You cannot worship something unless you submit to it willingly and totally. And secondly, worship always costs us something. When you're worshiping God, it must cost you something. It is obediently giving God what he wants and trusting him to provide whatever we need. Abraham has the assurance that Isaac will return with him. Think about this, though. Abraham is prepared to sacrifice his son in a, in a burnt offering, so he's going to be burnt up on the altar. So how can he come back? Well, Hebrews 11 fills in the blanks a little. Look what it says in Hebrews 11, verses 17 to 19 talks about this very experience by faith it says Abraham when God tested him offered Isaac as a sacrifice he who had embraced the promise was about to sacrifice his one and only son even though God had said to him it's through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead and so in a matter of speaking he did receive Isaac back from death Abraham was confident that even if he did sacrifice Isaac in the fire God had promised His blessing would come through Isaac, and so God would come through, even if that meant bringing Isaac's ashes back to life. It did not make sense to sacrifice his beloved son, but he was prepared to do it because God had told him to. God would somehow work it out to keep his promise to bless the world through Isaac, and even if he had to raise him from the dead. What is stunning is that in the previous 21 chapters of Genesis, we have no record of any knowledge of God resurrecting anything. And so, this was true faith. Abraham, it says, and continues on, took the wood for the burnt offering, placed it on, the, on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke upon him and said, Father, and uh, he said, Yes, my son, the fire and wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. Now, it doesn't say here, but scholars are almost in unison in believing that Isaac was probably anywhere between 14 and 18 years of age. This wasn't a little infant who didn't have a mind of his own. And so Isaac is wondering out loud as any of us would, where is the the fire? Where is the, the sacrifice? Where is the animal? God will provide, it says. The word provide here is gyra, and it means 
uh, has a very rich meaning. In fact, it's translated to either to see or to provide. God sees beforehand what it is and what he will provide. Abraham knew that God would somehow see to it that everything would work out. And that, my friend, is faith. It means God sees. We're not alone in any of the things we go through. God is watching. God is observing. God is seeing. And God will provide. Whatever you're going through, it'll all work out in the end. It'll all work out for God's glory. He will see to it, and he will provide for it. Verses 9 to 10, when they reached the place God had told them about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. Abraham had every intention of following through on his commitment to completely obey God and his command. But with a knife hovering in the air over his son, the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he said. Do not lay a hand on the boy. I do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham had passed the test, thankfully. But he still needed to complete the sacrifice. And so God made provision for him in verse 13. Abraham looked up and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. God's timing is almost always incredible, isn't it? If you look back on your life, when when God miraculously provided what wasn't there initially, it's unique timing. Somehow a shepherd had lost a sheep that day. Somehow it wandered over to the exact spot where Abraham could see it. Somehow it had caught its horns in the thicket of brush. Meaning that it was not bloodied or beat up. This lamb needed to be without imperfection according to Leviticus 22. And God provided just such a ram. Now Abraham offered this ram instead of his son. The ram took the place of Isaac. It became a a substitute offering for him. And verse 14 is where we see the first use of the, the only use of this name, Jehovah Jireh. So Abraham called the place, the Lord will provide, the Jehovah Jireh. And to this day, it is said on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. It can be provided, uh, translated again in three ways. The Lord will see, or the Lord will provide, or the Lord shall be seen. And in every single one of those possible translations, it fits perfectly here. The Lord will see what we're going through. The Lord will provide what we need to get through what we're going through. And the Lord shall be seen as the great Jehovah Jireh, the Lord provider. Jehovah Jireh expresses the idea that God sees our need, that God provides for it, and God is being seen doing so. You know, we sometimes say, well, I'll see to it. Well, that means what? It means that you'll get to it. You'll take care of it. You'll make sure that it happens. And basically this phrase means the Lord sees to it that you will be provided for. Look at the result of Abraham's obedience. The last verses here, 15 to 18. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies and through your offspring all the nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed. That word obey is the fourth word that's introduced here in chapter 22. Nowhere before have we seen obey. We saw disobey in in Adam and Eve and so many others of the stories in the first 21 chapters. But here we have reference to the idea of obeying. God tested him and Abraham obeyed. Oswald Chambers reminds us one step forward in obedience is worth years of studying it. If we obey, we learn to follow God. So what can we learn from today's passage? Jehovah is the provider and he always supplies the right things at the right time at the right place. He's never late, but he's seldom early. And he certainly doesn't cater to our timetable. It strikes me before we can know Jehovah Jireh, before we can experience God the provider, we must first be willing to obey him fully. If you want God to provide, you must be prepared for him to do so. We don't have to fully understand in order to surrender, but we do need to fully surrender and trust in him. It's like the story I heard of a house on fire. 
little girl was trapped in her upstairs bedroom and she leaned out the window. Her father, who was on the ground, said, jump and I will catch you. The little girl was afraid, afraid and replied, but I can't even see you. To which the father shouted, that's okay, I can see you. And so she jumped to safety, not because she could see, but because she trusted the voice of her father who told her to jump. She was willing to let go. And it was in letting go that she was ultimately provided for. Is there anything you're holding on to today? What is your Isaac? It may be your career. It might be a relationship or a possession. Maybe it's your retirement or your, your college plans. Maybe it's a child or a parent. It's time to put everything on the altar of God. I'm not implying that all of our possessions are bad or we should get rid of them. But I am saying that if we're not careful, our possessions can end up what? Possessing us. Whenever we have an Isaac that we have lifted up on high, God will eventually ask for us to sacrifice it because he wants us to trust in him, not the gifts that he has given us. Abraham was willing to praise God and give up that which was most important before he saw God's provision because he was determined that he would be worshiping the blesser and not the blessing. Trust God to provide for your needs. And when you do, you will find him to be your Jehovah Jireh. Call out to Jehovah Jireh by name and ask for his provision. But first, make sure you have settled the issue of preeminence. Who is most significant to you? Who or what occupies the very first place, the top place in your heart? Did you know that God asks us to make a sacrifice like this today? In Romans 12, the Apostle Paul tells us, Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. So what is sacrifice? It's, it's giving up something valuable for something that's even more valuable. What does God ask us to sacrifice? Ourselves, our very being. He asks because he wants... No, he, he doesn't want. He demands to be the most important part of our lives. It's only as we sacrifice what's most important that we'll discover that God is most important and then he will provide for us in such a profound way we can only know that it came from him. Whatever God calls you to do, be assured he will provide you the resources to do it. Abraham was called to offer a sacrifice. It was God who provided him what he needed to make that sacrifice. Time and time again, Old Testament prophets learned that when God called them to do something, he also promised to give them the resources to see it out. When you go through a season of testing, remember that Jehovah sees. When your month outlasts your money, remember that God will provide. When you're feeling totally overwhelmed with life, remember that God will provide. When you're troubled, trust in Jehovah Jireh. Now in our closing moments together, I would ask if, if uh, Matthew and Stephen uh, in, the, in the back could uh, get the communion elements. In our closing moments, I'd like for us to see this passage, however, in a very different light, a slightly different light. No indication here was that Isaac had done anything that required punishment. And yet he was sacrificed or uh, asked to be sacrificed anyway. And Jesus certainly was innocent. For God made Christ, it says in 2 Corinthians 5, who never sinned to be the offering for our sins so that we could be made right with God in Christ. Isaac carried wood on his back. Jesus, if you recall, bore the weight of a cross on his back as he walked through the streets of Jerusalem on the way to a hill called Calvary. Both Isaac and Jesus were obedient unto death as they quietly submitted to the will of their respective fathers. Both Isaac and Jesus were bound in preparation for death. Mount Moriah is where the temple was eventually built, the very place where the blood of the ram soaked into the wood was where countless offerings of blood were presented in the temple. Scholars tell us that Mount Moriah is another name for Calvary, the place where Jesus gave his life for our sins, where his blood stained a wooden cross. Abraham and Isaac traveled how many days to the mountain? Three days. Where Isaac's life was eventually spared, Jesus was buried for three days before coming back to life again. Isaac learned firsthand about a substitutionary sacrifice where the lamb was killed in his place. Likewise, Jesus as the perfect lamb of God gave his life for us in our place as well. 
when Abraham experienced Jehovah Jireh, he made an altar there so that he could remember. And we've been given something as well to help us to remember. It's called communion. It's a table of remembrance. It's a place where we keep in mind that God has provided and that he will also always provide. It's a time for us to prepare to receive his provision by making sure we have surrendered everything to him. Are you ready to let go and let God?